again, I say what a, uh, what a privilege and fulfillment I feel uh, after 54 years of going in one direction and then trying to figure out ways to uh, reflect that love. And, and that's, of course, love and justice was God's motivation for redemption. Uh, we was created to bear the, the image of God in the world. And, uh, and so the beginning was, was love. He, his image says that he created people in a sense of responsible brother and sisterhood. We are our brother's keeper. And so justice is the outcome of that. And, and uh, it said better, and it says, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he was explaining uh, really justice. That was, the, that was the issue. That was the, out, that was the illustration of the Good Samaritan there, and that was uh, justice. So justice was the motivation. And, and if we get back there, but the outworking of that then was to be loved. So love was a motivation. His love for the toll of his creation uh, is what motivated. And so when you, for me it was, and I think it's for everyone, that when you find God, you find his love. And for me, it was, a, and of course, now, of course, everything on me, in me, is a reflection back. Like I said this morning, you look back and you see where God was involved uh, in, your, in your life. Uh, it, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's another passage. Uh, when Jesus encountered Nicodemus about this whole idea of being born again, being born into the family of God, having this eternal life and. uh stuff and Nicodemus say how can this be uh, how can a person enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again and uh, then he ended that conversation he said are you a teacher are you a teacher in Israel and Israel was Jacob and Jacob is the model then of being born again and, and are you a teacher of, Jesus, of Jacob and don't realize that he was born again? Well, when was he born again? He was born again. His, his name was Jacob, sort of a cheetah, because he cheated his brother. He cheated his father-in-law. He became rich <laughs> through that cheat. And, uh, and, 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 and so the, when was he born again? He was born again when he, he faced the crisis of his life. He was meeting his brother Esau, and he heard that he was coming to meet him when he was on his way back home with 400, with 400 men, soldiers. And he thought that he would be killed. And that night, that night, he wrestled with God all night. And at that night then, the angels came down from heaven. Jesus answered that question there. Can anyone ascend up to heaven? No. They that come down from heaven, the angels came down. He explained that. And that night, uh, Jacob was born again. He says that at the end of the chapter, at the end of uh, Genesis, he said, the God who had fed me all my life is that God who met me that night and he redeemed me from all of my evil. Now, the, the, the trick here is that he had a, he walked with a limp after that. And so the idea of, 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 the, of the Christian, there ought to be a dynamic change in their life when they are, and their life ought to be absolutely uh, different. But what was unique about that, 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 that he laid hold of God 
with love and wouldn't let him go. And wouldn't let him go in life. And so the, and then, then Jesus is going to end, are y'all following me? Jesus is going to end this passage with, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, uh, uh, but the world be saved. Uh, one of the problems that we are facing now, love is the final fight. That's what I'm explaining here. Love was the beginning of the fight, and love is the final fight. And right now, the big issues today is the affirmation of this humanity in love, even before you say anything to them, the need for that. And, and one of the things that this new generation of young folks are doing, um, as I look at this new emerging generation, they are restoring love as it relates to the, the music. We had sort of lost that. And, and that's what makes rap the, the downside of rap. I know one could rap Christian stuff, but it's the downside of rap. But in my community, we have embraced it in a way you can't bring in a discipline. And, and it's that way in m many phases of our life today. Uh, we are condemning people. And Jesus said he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And, and today in this generation, we got to develop uh, a message and behavior in terms of our Christian witness in terms of affirmation. Let me illustrate it. What you think of the sex movement and where you think it's going, uh, you know, that's your feeling about that. But what they hear from us is an old, worn-out language. We have got to make our witness here now because that witness says a whole lot about the family, and the structure, and that all of us know in the urban community is the, what is the animal there? What is the elephant in the room in my community is a broken family. And those broken families don't get the affirmation they need from the father or maybe the mother. And that's a lot of the behavior, all people who are working on that. Senator Monahan said that way back in the 70s when he saw the deterioration of the urban family and what was going and and he talked about what is going to happen in so many ways and what we are seeing now that neglecting of the family because the family was to be the place of affirmation and 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 and, and we have a worn out this is the point I'm making we have a a worn out Language is not a language of love. It's a language of hate. You don't find that in Jesus. He came not to condemn the world. Let me illustrate it one time. Okay, so the gays, so the lesbians, I've approached. This is the worn out language. Is a, I love you, but I hate your sin. That's not biblical. It's not a biblical approach to humanity. Why do you have to bring up love? Why do you have to bring up sin at this point? And sin is primarily the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so our language should be a, such a language of love and embracement. Maybe you do something with the, uh, the conversation, but the person you got to embrace the person before you chain them, before you chain them in society. So that what I'm really saying here is that I started with love. The biblical starts with love. And I'm saying now I'm ending my life. That's what I'm really saying is, the, is this affirmation of love. And so that's what I'm saying, love. And we got to learn now how to, how to, how to, uh, how to do that. So let me tell you about my own uh, 
conversion. Uh, my mother died when I was seven months old, and my father couldn't read or write. He dropped us off at his mother's home, and she had been the mother of 19 children. And, and so I'm not from a religious background, so I grew up without the affirmation of love. And, uh, and that's what I discovered when I came to Christ and the passage of scripture that brought me the fullness and the wholeness of the gospel was this Galatians 2.20. If you want to know the, the incarnational understanding of the redemptive truth, and Paul would do that, and Jesus would do that, and Isaiah would do that, the great preachers, uh, they would always give you a, 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 a holistic approach but the main point of it would be the depths of God's love for you. And, and of course, we're saying that the problem in the ghetto has to do with that broken family and love. And so what I was seeking for in life, growing up without a mother and father, growing up without that love. Uh, and so when I heard this Galatians 2.20, this is sort of the theology of redemption. I'm talking about here, the theology of justice, the theology of reconciliation and all of that. And when Paul said, I, and, and this is, and you, and I read Galatians again this morning. Uh, what Paul then said, what, what are your behavior? What are your behavior should be? They were saying, why are you behaving the way you behave? When I came there, how you behave? and how you turn away from that behavior. Who are you? Who am I? Paul said, uh, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, he said, yet not I, but it's Christ who lived in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. That's when I heard the gospel. When I found out that God and the depths of God's love and, 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 and that's the central message of the gospel is getting a grip. And, and that's a, a felt need in the hierarchies of, 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 of development of humanity. Love is the, is, is the number one idea. And so the gospel is about God's love. And I said, if there's a God in heaven, that love me enough to send his only begotten son into the world to die for me. I want to know that God. Two things I felt when I was converted. I felt a deep sense of my sin and a deep sense of my ignorant. And the ignorant was that he had already died for me and I didn't realize it and had never affirmed that. And I said, if there's a God in heaven, to love me enough to die for me, I want to know that God. I want to know that God. I, I think in our, in our reconciliation and all of our, and I lead nonprofit organization and church planning organization, but that ought to be led within the context more and more of God's love and the social dimension is, is an expression of God's love for all people. Uh, uh, and God wants us, and so it's an act of love uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let your light so shine before the humanity that they might see your good works of love and glorify the Father which is in heaven. They are not saved by my works but they see an expression of my love for them in my good work. And so you gotta be preaching the gospel in both words and deeds. And as a part of our integration of this holism, there's always that tension, but that's the tension you should always live with. And the most tension, the most tension then is to tell them about this wonderful love.
Some people then will take the works itself, but the works is an expression of the depths of God's love for everybody. So our good works is that expression of love. And so we don't only love just in words and in tongue, but in deeds and in truth in life. And, and, uh, and you know, I probably when we started CCDA, we, although I had started the church first, but I could see the poverty of the people in the community. And our faith was not witnessing to their at poverty. And that we can even take incidents and, and get so involved, and we ought to be involved in the emotion of, of the poverty. But we should realize that's what's going to be the most important part of that redemption is that they come to know Jesus Christ, never to neglect the poor. In preaching of the gospel, caring for the poor was an absolute part of it. It, it, it. It's not thought of as being a decision we make. Paul says that when they went out in the gospel. The mandate was, you know, tell them the redemptive story, but to remember the poor. Because remembering the poor then reflects our commitment to the gospel. True religion and under five before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans and to keep oneself unspotted before the, for the world. And, and so it's, it's our redemption involved in the whole person must be a part of the, of the message that we brought. And of course, that's where we've been coming from. We've been, we've been coming. In our day, it was a, re, it was a reflect, it was a, it was a, a time in the wealth of our country was growing in, uh, in the face of communism. And so communism was doing social action and had rejected God. We sort of went all over then to doing the spiritual thing. And there's many other reasons because our poor represented our unjust system. And we, as I said this morning, it, it, was, it was difficult then for the folks who was running the institution to reject the society because it was becoming rich in, in its society. And, and we become, as I said this morning, uncomfortable a deal. And, and so we went all to just getting them saved. And if they just get them saved, that's okay. But we know now, even in sociology and in the church, the best poverty program is a good job. Amen. It gives people the greatest amount of freedom uh, uh, in the world. And so we should be working to really, truly release the power of God through our good work in a way that produces work and developing people so they can do creative uh, work. And work is not a curse after the fall. It means that it's going to be more difficult. But even life itself and the birth of children, uh, you wouldn't call that a curse, would you? A real curse in, 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 in life. And, 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 but, it, uh, yeah. So when I'm talking then about love as being found a fight, I'm talking about how we behave and really how we uh, uh, preach the gospel. But another time when I was, uh, when we got back to Mississippi about 10 years ago, and I was more than 10 years ago now, I was teaching my daughter, and we was talking about, she was, I had an early morning Bible class. That's when I teach. I have a 5.30 Bible class every Tuesday of guys. It's about 13 of us, and that class has been going on for, uh, about 13 years in Jackson, and then I'd had it in California. And basically, throughout my history, I would always have a, a 
early morning Bible class, or people would come to me, and we would say, but I want you to disciple me and help me somewhere. And I said, uh, and we started talking about you can never find the time to do it. You know, it was consistent. And I said, well, then uh, let's do it at 5.30 in the morning. And, uh, and that would also have been good because uh, they had to make a commitment. And, and, and we had this discussion, and I think it's at lunch, is uh, the, key to, the key to success, the key to biblical success, the teach this, the, is, is, of course, the discipleship, but the key to that is the commitment. Commitment. And that's one of the weakness in the Christian faith today. The, co- the commitment is too weak and it's too much to me. It don't have a, an end outside of yourself. The Christian faith is a commitment to the obedience and discipleship of others. That's what Christian is about. That's what Christianity is about. And if that's not built into it, and it's got to be intentional. And that's why multi church planning, racial church planning, will be the church of tomorrow and of today. It's coming. Because people now is making that intentional commitment, and it which means it's, that commitment is going to be a little bit different than other, but you, because you are committed to the evil that has come out of that long time enslavement, you know, in the society. Those people who we have neglected, which is the poor, or what, however that come about in society. And so that's my life is, is to that. Back to my daughter then, I was talking to her, and, uh, and as I was talking to her, this is another commitment that I made, uh, I think Pentecostal people would call what I'm saying a filling of the spirit. <laughs> I think that's Pentecostal. Okay. And what I'm calling is, is a deeper commitment and a commitment that has to do with the issues of life in the society and how the church take on those human needs, take on the, the toughness of the human needs. And, and, and the church will do that. The church will do that. And the church will do that. It need guiding. It need guiding. And even as we, as you see it today, uh, we want to apply uh, the greatest human needs to the problem we see, but we haven't found out how to do it. Again, that's what makes our CCDA so relevant. Because we said we was going to get people together in the church and in the community who's already meeting these human needs. We were going to get them together and that we were going to draw people together who are solving those problems, believing that the people with the problem has the best chance of solving the problem if you give them the understanding and the technology to deal with it. And one of the slogans we use in that is this slogan, it's old. Uh, when I was in China, they told me it was, it was more than 2,000 years old, is our principle through which we do uh, Christian community development. We say, go to the people, live among them, love them, learn from them, find out what's their need. Because that's the most damaging thing in our charity, is that how we lay up on people the needs that we think those projects don't work. The needs have to come out of the pain of the people. And then in development, they got to own it. 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 If they don't own it, it becomes charitable, and it makes them think that it's, you're supposed to do this for us. You're supposed to do this. And you lose because uh, love should be the response. There should be gratitude. There should be gratitude. I mean, that should be our motivation for, for our involvement in Christ's redemptive work because we have felt that he took a burden away, he removed our sin, that he loved us, and so we are learning, we are doing this in gratitude for that redemption. And that's why some of us don't just give away food 
I had a, that's a little bit in my sermon this morning when I said, uh, uh, the Lord, my shepherd, I shall not, I didn't say won't, I shall not be in need because we want, there are certain thirsts that human need to, to, to seek for that fulfillment. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Uh, the, the slogan in the Bible, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's a pretty good slogan. It's a pretty good slogan because that's a hunger that ought to get it. And if you start meeting those needs without their expression, the line gets longer. The line gets longer. And the line gets longer and the work ethic disappears. And if, even as I go to prison today, people will say, if I'm a felony, I can't get a job. They have wanted to believe that. They have wanted to believe that. That's a big lie. And most of the jobs out there, the startup jobs out there, people don't care. Now, there are these sophisticated security jobs that they're talking about. But then for them to say that, and they almost use that as an excuse, and the people who get healed really after incarceration, uh, first in some kind of era of discipleship, responsibility, and then in getting a job. Those are the ones who don't go back. Those are the ones who don't go back. Those who have to, too, take responsibility for some of their own life, they recover. And the other one, make their failure ongoing, your failure, so I didn't fail. It was you that, and so in all of our development, it's got to add to, and all of our love must respond with a sense of gratitude. Inside. So you don't help people to be, for them to brag on you. <laughs> you, know, you. That ain't why you have them. But if they don't appreciate what you're doing, then you don't help them at all in their development. And so it's what we are saying that love is a found fight. How do we really love people in a significant way where they will have that sense of gratitude? And how do we nurture them in that sense? That's the task, and this is the task. It's no longer an idea. I'm almost moving, uh, I'm putting reconciliation back in the central message of the gospel. And now I'm saying that, that, that we then has got to uh, almost like, we got to be almost like what we are doing and the way we are doing development ought to be the change that we ought to be some of that change that we want to see. We ought to be some of that change that we want to see. I mean, so that, that's what is my, what is my found here is that the, the, the central message of redemption. And in that central message of redemption, you see the depths of God's love. And now we love because he first loved us. And, and, and so talking about the incarnation, and this is new in my lifetime. We, 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 we put the gospel in, which is the way it was worked out in the life of Jesus, the death, the bearer, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That made the provision and that become the central message in which we preach. But that we then have to then do this good work as our present to, to be that words and deed within our society. Okay, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> questions about the question. Any questions? I can take a chair now. 
Uh, and we, th thank you. We will have mics over here and on this side. I'd ask you to uh, make your way if you have questions to one of those two microphones. And I would say, um, uh, Dr. Perkins, it's uh, encouraging me to hear you again. Uh, I heard you uh, the first time about 35 years ago. How many years? About 35. I've been around. I like that. <laughs> That was amazing. And you know what? I would say this, that you haven't lost much fire, brother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's great. Can't walk quite oh, a Oh, man. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, but you know what, what it reminds me of? You know, you're talking about love, etc. Uh, um, of course, it's a title of a book, but a long obedience in the same direction. That, that's what comes to mind as I, as I hear you again today. Yeah. And so I'm very grateful for that. Anyway, we've got a number of questions. Please, Greg. It's gone. Okay. Here, this one's working. Let's just, we'll get them to, we'll get them to work. Just a, uh, a word of appreciation. This young man, well, that where he heard you was in Fargo, North Dakota, where what, I was in, what Far about? in Fargo, North Dakota, where I was pastoring, and you came and visited our church. I now teach here, but I remember something was, was that you I said. With, was I with the Episcopal Church? Well, who was I with when I, I go out and speak for the nomination this and was, they invite me to come out? It was an out. evangelical free church. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things you said there that I have remembered that I want to, I want to ask you to update. You said that in, uh, in Jackson or Mendenhall, wherever it was, you uh, wanted to train some of the young men not to be materialistic about their clothing. So you wore a pair of blue jeans and the same shirt every day and you washed it out every night and put it back on. To train and then you. the people started taking my faded out shirt and the, 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 the business community and began to make them like faded that. out. Yeah. And began to make them with the knees out. <clears throat> Go ahead. You set the trend. That's what you did. You set the trend. So I, I remembered that. I remember that all of these years that the power of example now, what I'm wondering is, what are you doing now? Uh, or what do, would you recommend that we do by power of example to reinforce this message, which is really your life? Yeah. And, and, and there, is a, there is a yearning for now mentoring and tutoring. So I'm saying we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity. And we done concluded that we're drawing that from the teaching of Jesus, that, that uh, the best learning is from a tutor. Uh, uh, I didn't go to Bible school. I didn't go to university or college. Uh, I teach in university and college and seminary, uh, theology. Uh, I'm here talking about uh, a holistic view of theology. Uh, but the old man, an old Presbyterian elder, who taught me two days a week, two afternoons a week, and um, he dreamed in me, uh, and that's what makes it personal. You tutor somebody, you can see their aptitude. You can see what they might be. And in many cases, they're going to want to be like the person that's tutoring them as you go along because you're going to begin to dream your dream in their life. That's what happened to me. And I, and I was a third grade dropout, and he would tell me then what I was going to be. And almost all what I've been involved in in these 50 years, he almost like said to me, I was going to be doing that. Now, I didn't, it was difficult to believe, but because of his love for me, and uh, that, I, that I believed it in the end, and it came to pass. So, uh, uh, an, an, another illustration, and I give the answer, I'm, I'm giving you an answer now, and the answer is, how do we be with people in tutoring and feel their hopes and dream uh, dream some dream for them to have hope in you know and and, and uh, 
uh, in life. So I think that the, in, the, answer, the answer is that environment of our lives sincerely in the life of somebody else and getting with them and learning from them and then dream, dream related to what they're learning. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and again, they're gonna they're gonna be more like you. I was a, I was a, I go in, in Columbus, Ohio. I go there and teach a lot, and uh, I met a, a a judge, a lawyer judge, in there, and we became friends. And uh, and one day in the midst of a meeting, I was speaking like this, and he got up and said, "I'm a," he was almost like he was a one of the big judge, a federal judge. It was almost like, I'm too, big, I'm too big to do anything. What can I do? That's sort of, you know, you can hear the question. So what can a person like me do? And, uh, and I said, uh, you can find some young man in, in about the seventh, eighth grade, and you tutor him. He took me up on that. Make a long story short, I, went, I kept going back. I'd stay with this judge. And, and he was tutoring this boy. He tutored him for about seven years, six or seven years. And I went back there to, to speak, and he wasn't there, because he always come to where I'm speaking. I said, where's the judge? He said, he's at Morehouse enrolling that boy in, in, in Morehouse. Uh, uh, a lawyer was being bond. <laughs> You know, that, that, that a lawyer was being bond. So I, I, I think that's, and, and this is the opportunity. The opportunity now is authentic discipleship. Authentic, and, and, and all of us should be doing it. All of us should be uh, sharing our life and dreaming our dream into the lives of, of uh, people. Of course, finding their dream, finding their aptitude. You, you, you know what I'm saying? But then you dreaming it. Uh, my, my, my tutor was a white old man, and uh, he thought that he couldn't reach black at that state because of the separation of the, and the races, racism. But he dreamed what he would do, and he would say things to me, and if I were you, this is what I'd be doing. And he dreamed those dreams, and that's what discipleship will do for you. Follow me, Peter, and I'll make you fish of the man. Uh, Zykeel, follow me, and I'll make you an honest tax collector. You're an honest tax collector. You can keep on tax. You can do, keep on doing that. But give off that money you got back and a little bit more because you made it multiply. <laughs> You, you, you know, yeah. And so I think that's, and, 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 and the urban community is waiting on that. Um, now, we found out in the school, when you tutor, we, we adopted a school, an elementary school. We found that tutoring three kids at one time because of the influence of gang and the influence of the negative uh, if one say something about the tutor, there's gonna be one there is tracking with you. And that one is not gonna let you put that person down too deeply because they, they, he would have been able to see the love in that guy. And so that keeps the, that keeps the group going. That is sort of a scientific deal because people in, uh, is being led by other people and it's being led by the strongest negative force. And so the bully, the bully is, is, is that's bad. That's bad. They are teaching people how to kill, do things, you, you, you know, because others are going to join with them. And many times this bully might be woofing, you know, but the other young person, the timid person, will join with that in, in life. Yeah, did I help you? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, here first, please. No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, she is first, and then you're, you follow. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Perkins, um, this is kind of funny. You answered most of my questions in that last question, but um, I had your 
um, original book, When Justice Grows Down, and you had an afro then, so I didn't recognize you exactly. But I was like, this is Dr. Perkins. I used Perkins. to have hair, she's saying. I'm like, this is great. And um, I also had three VHSs. That's how old this is. And it was three of them. And I've moved so much, I only have the last one uh, with regards to the CCDA. So I am just, uh, when Daniel Harmon told me that you were going to be here, I was just so honored. I just put down everything. And I said, I'm going to be there. And um, I'm just honored, and I just thank God for this opportunity. And one of the things that you talked about was the breakdown of the African-American community. And I, I find this something so close to my heart because I'm, my ministry is in North Chicago. Now, I'm not an official ministry. I call that my ministry because I can't leave, and that's where God brought me back to. And that's where I am, uh, substitute teacher with kids. I tutor. We need more tutors, and I find that one of the, 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 the biggest problems is what you said, is the lack of fatherlessness. We have our, most of our men incarcerated, and I do know they really can't get jobs because I work with the Coalition to Reduce Recidivism. There is a, we are a, a model for the country. Lake County, I'm telling you, Lake County, the Coalition to Reduce Recidivism, who is chaired by my good friend uh, Patricia Joan, Township Supervisor. But so many of the men are in jail, and we don't have them in the community as fathers and as leaders. And when they come out, they can't get jobs. And men cannot be men without jobs. And they are they're ashamed. And we can't do it as women. I, I, I just say, a, a mother cannot be a father. God didn't make it that way. But I want to ask you, what can we do? Uh, get, being on the streets, we in church, and it's mostly all ladies in the black church, okay? It's mostly all women and a few men. But we have got to do something. We got more men in the jailhouse and nobody in the church house. And we just got to bring, I mean, what do you think we could do? You've, you've answered a lot of it, but we've got to bring the African-American men. And I don't mean our mentors have to be all African-American men, because any I, mentor I, I can you. find, I'll use them, okay? I hear you. What can we do to, first of all, free up and get most, so many of our African-American men out of jail? And youth now, it's juvenile now, it's going to another level of incarceration. The juvenile population is going up, the young men. What can we do about this problem? And also, how can we get more mentors? No matter what color, we need mentors for these young men. Men need to see men leading. I'm sorry. You're okay, okay. A little in the midst, you hit up on the problem in the urban community. And, and not only that problem has been in the past, um, ghetto rise, and what was paralyzing, Capri de Green, and those, but now it's suburbanizing. I think it offers an opportunity. I think it offers an opportunity for the multiracial church. Uh, and, uh, and, and they are, I know in many of the cities, maybe not sure, they are, they are, they are, people are leaving the urban because they're redeveloping them, gentrifying them, and uh, now there's apartment complex along the freeway, along the bus line. That's for, so people can have uh, 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 access. And that's where I think the, uh, it's, it's not enough men, black men to disciple black boys. So that poses a problem right there. Uh, there is a yearning, I think. Uh, so a, a multiracial church, I think it'll be a little bit more creative. I think we'll get to know each other. I think we'll work out. It's, it's too massive while we got to have individual response. But we always got to think of a, uh, the multitude, you know, that we got a, we got a ministry in Mississippi 
we started off with great hopes and ideas for reconciliation there, but they're going to change Mississippi one person at a time. That's foolishness. We, movements is what change people. It's the multitudes. And out of the multitude, you get to commit it. So you asking me for an individual response. It's too much for you, individual. You're going to burn out. But you got to be, and then you got to be in an environment of own nurture. Otherwise, you're going to start and stop. That's one side. These young ministers here, let's say the black ministers, have ought to want to uh, integrate their church, <laughs> multi-race their church, uh, so that together we can take more responsibility. Because the, 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 what people want to do today, the internet is the new e-com. It's a new opportunity for business development in the world. And so we need each other. We need, and, and, and many times the immigrants come here, they come from communities where there was more business viability. Uh, what they do now, most immigrants, provide the services for the ghetto young folk, but they don't provide jobs. A partnership then would provide ownership both for black and for a place for the immigrants. That was going to help us more with our job producing. And that, in the end, that's going to be, we got, we discipling them to get a job in the end. We send them to college to get a job or to make job in the end. You get the idea? And so it's the economy, it's the stewardship of the economy. Uh, and so it's, 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 and that's the call, and it's a movement that way. There's a group, uh, there are city people now wanting city ministry, and we're trying to get city, CCDA, we try to organize in particular given neighborhood. And then we try to join those people together so we can have some impact. But we don't come up with a one city ministry unless and that's a coalition. You understand for information. So we do something very permanent. We do something where we can have effect in the community. And so it, it, and that's all we can do it. Because what's broken is the family. And then what's broken in the community and what we are saying is what the sociologists call pathological. What that mean that the problem is bigger than the solution, <laughs> you, you, you know? And so we got to come up with ways to solve those problems at a community level where that project become a prototype. And now we can order that prototype to other people. That's what CCDA is about. And, and that's, uh, yeah, about so so. You are, you are talking about a, a huge, it, and we are talking about a leadership problem among our pastors. Now, black pastors that are a little bit successful, they, they go with fear because they have fear if they, if they join with a the white, they're not going to be the pastor. They're going to always be the second man. You, you, you understand? They're going to think it's going to take too long to do that. And if they do that, the, the, they're going to say that the, that the, people is going to follow the white man and not follow the black man. That's fear. And fear never work out good. And fear paralyzes you. It has torment in it. So that that's why the, the multiracial churches to me, that's hard to say. That's hard to say. But I'm, and I'm finding, and I'm the organizer of these organizations, uh, uh, White folks are providing most of the money for these initiatives as I go out. And so we are not even, you, you get the idea? So that we are working so much in our own silo and not working for the bigger impact. No, I'm not, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a 10-year 
city impact, I'm talking about those prototypes become models in the neighborhood, in the community, that we are making progress together because we're intentional. We're intentional. And, and, and to me, uh, that's uh, to carry you back into the community by yourself. You need to do that, but boy, you're going to burn out. And if you don't have a pastor, and that's one of the toughest things I find in the black community. I find that the black women are being educated. I go to the conference, they come to my conference, and they'll say to me, I want to do what you want to do. And I say, why you don't do it in your church? My pastor won't let me. So you got a real, nobody have this conversation. This conversation does not have. This conversation is not had. And so what we got to do is that we've got to be authentically reconciled. Whose church is we building? Whose church is we building? Is this my church? Or is this Christ's church? And is this relevant to the needs? They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, all people from their sin in the community. And in this case, this is teaching in the Bible, is that the people with the resources is supposed to help the people without the resources through that distress so that when they have problems, uh, I, I remember in Jackson, this illustration, I talked too much. But we, we had a, we you have floods in Mississippi and we had, most of the floods is in the lower area across the track, and that's where the blacks used to be, you know, all there. And so it was always the white coming over helping us, and we had some flood. And then we had a flood that was a mega flood, and we had made some relationship in Mississippi with a white church, one particular white church. We had made a relationship with them. And when the flood hit their community, I said, we stopped all that we were doing. I was going back in those days. We had a a huge staff, and I, we stopped all of our activity and went into the community to help the white community. And the people was weeping. I mean, that, that we came to their rescue. The pastor was weeping in, in the community. It's that um, Henry Ford's idea. Coming together is the beginning. Working together is progress, stand together is success. And that's what a church is about. But I wish sometime I could put some churches out of business. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you know, and so planting, you, you, you hear me? Uh, I, these, are, these are little issues, but they're big. They're big. They're big. And, and, it, and it's easy for us to do the little thing, but not see the big imp implication of what's going to happen. And always think that what you're doing is a prototype. You are the solution, but you're a solution as other folks, as you model it out, and they pick up your model. Again, CCDA was to carry these models into different cities and show the people who was already doing it and get those people engaged. And, we're, and what I'm seeing now, I said it this morning, the, the cloud is here. The, the, the college is sending in seminary, is preparing to go back into those communities and to be that intentional within our society. It's a big article today in the uh, USA Today, and I guess in your paper, is, is uh, it's big, big. It's, it's, it's big, it's got dangers in it is that the country is moving towards a multi-racial, a nation of minorities. That's good news, which means what I'm saying, God is doing it. The bad news is how the majority white has been damaged with their own imperialism and what that action will be. And I could illustrate things. I, I went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh once. What had happened was the football players 
and, and basketball players, and a lot of them in Pittsburgh, you know, was, was, was making a lot of money and they were moving into the rich community. Well, uh, they didn't, uh, the rich folk didn't leave. They had money too. They were going to put that into a class thing. <laughs> and they're going to they're gonna handle that one, you know. You know. But what happened was uh, uh, this, number one is, when they moved in this community, the pastor talked to the ladies and they began to invite, to welcome these women. They was fair for these girls from Mississippi, these beautiful queens. They were marrying them football players. And, uh, and what happened was, what happened was, the, uh, one of the wives got sick. And then all of the women came to their rescue. And they had to come get me to come out there and spend some time with them because the pastor didn't know what to do with all of this multiracial churches. What I'm saying, when you start to work in together, eventually it will break down the barriers. That, that's the point I'm making. And that we can then utilize the, 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 the neighborhood resources and they will, be, uh, they will see the significance of it. Yes. Okay, another Thank question. You. Thank so you very much. You got much. a big problem. Uh, if, if I knew the whole way to do it, I would be the consultant for the prison justice system, and you wouldn't have me here, because they would be paying me so much money. That I wouldn't... <laughs> yes, please. Uh, Dr. Perkins, it's such an honor to have you here on campus. Uh, my name is Josh Wilson. I'm a graduating MDiv student and uh, a huge fan. You're a personal hero. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, just briefly today, um, recently events such as uh, the shooting deaths of Trayvon Martin and more recently Mike Brown have uh, brought the racial tensions in our, our society uh, to the surface and really put them under the national spotlight. Uh, for those of us uh, like myself who are a part of majority culture, um, what would you advice would you give us uh, on how we might respond in a way that at the same time shows solidarity um, with our brothers and sisters of color um, and yet speaks constructively, if prophetically, uh, to others in majority culture uh, who may be both ignorant and perhaps resistant to the ideas of white privilege and structural racism uh, that we're encountering. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, there's going to be multiple types of response you can make. So we want to make something that has. Uh, I think what we need to do is, is, you've heard it before, but I think we need to develop uh, network bonds within the community and began to work on that. The, the big problem they had there was a slowness to get leaders. They had to go somewhere else to get some leaders for the community. Well, they ought to already be there. So we got to set up these opportunities now. And I think, I, I think they're gonna happen. I think some of it gonna happen. But I, I, I think that we got to make ourselves available for that multiracial group. We need to have a, a monthly, uh, uh, bi-monthly form. If, it would, if something like that would, would tempt to happen in Jackson now, it, it, it wouldn't have that stability now because we have a form. We have a, 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 a Friday's form and we have a Saturday's form. And, and when I'm in town, I go to my Friday's form I go to, and, and this is, we are talking about jobs and opportunity, and that we also have developed a sort of a, an investment group where we are starting involved in starting business enterprises in the community. And I could tell you about one of those, that, well, I could tell you about a couple of them, but I can tell you one I'm working with now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll it out to the society. And it come out of a sort of a tutoring, uh, so there's, there's a, uh, uh, I, I think we got to get to know each other. The thing didn't move. It, it didn't begin to come down. They had to go find a highway patrol that was born out there that knew enough people to bring him in there to be an example, a black one. Uh, 
That was a leadership crisis. And, and all of our problems of human development are leadership problems. I guess you, you understand that. Leaders are the, whenever God see a problem in society, he meets that person somewhere and give them a vision. And that vision turns into a passion and that person become a leader. And so then without a vision, the people perish. And what we had there, we didn't have the leadership in place there. Uh, I hope something better and good come out of that, but I hope that we all take examples by that, by that. Uh, we shouldn't burn our cities now. We need more job instead of job, but we also need to have multiracial business, all businesses that both black and white and other minorities, we all in the community. And we should be welcoming each other to provide the goods and the services that they can provide within the neighborhood and community. So I think looking at that, you know, I, I say that about, you know, I, I talk about relocation, you know, I, I talk about that, but I also tell people, maybe where you should relocate. Uh, don't relocate alone. Relocate where you have visited and built in some kind of a bond of a relationship uh, there. And so you re re relocate into some kind of a caring of love. And then I say sometimes when you, when you just have your real chart, you want to develop something in the black community, I say go to where the where the, where, the, where the ones stop and the other began, and almost like get in between. You, you, you can see those dividing lines. You see what I'm talking about? I'm saying the idea of, 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 of relocating is, is, to, is, to, is to keep those relationships and, 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 and build on our getting to know each other. Uh, uh, no progress makes until we really know each other. No progress happen, basic for human development, uh, uh, until we talk together, talk together. Uh, and so uh, people are ready for that. I hope these incidents show us that it can happen anywhere. There is a, any place where there is 5,000 of one minority group, particular Black minority, because the young folks who get trapped, they get so limited. The television becomes their limitation, and uh, and and they don't go very far. And in, in many of these places, uh, the schools now are more segregated. Not more. Many of the schools, particularly in the tough community, is about as segregated as they was 30 years ago, 35 years ago, because private schools and other schools, and, I, and I'm not telling nobody what school to send their kids to. I don't do that. Kids are too precious for somebody else to tell you where to send them. You should take your responsibility for yourself for that. And I'm not supposed to take responsibility for your children, and you're not supposed to. I'm talking about in terms of telling you what to do. I want you to do that, you know. Yeah, people always ask me that. I said that in my book with Justice for All 35 years ago, and if they ask me again, I said the same thing. Uh, People send their kids because they are precious, and you're responsible. Responsible. Yeah. And any in any mentoring, the goal is to get that kid loving you, so you can give that child and that love back to the family, back to the family, and so giving the family the responsibility for their own children. And so, okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to piggyback, Jeffrey, you can come up, but I'd like to piggyback on that. Uh, there's a, uh, it is related to the uh, uh, incident in Ferguson when you were uh, interviewed and, and uh, asked a series of questions and y your response, but the problem, uh, you stated, for years we have been tiptoeing around trying to work out a human response to biblical reconciliation. Uh, we need a biblical response, not a human response. Uh, and then the question was, well, what is a biblical response? And to this, you shared a few things, uh, but then said this, and I would be interested in your uh, comments on this. Americans take the history of enslavement too lightly because 
we have benefited from it. We have not repented deeply enough of the sin of racism. As Christians, we know that our problem always is sin. Um, and, and I know that the sin of racism, which goes back to the sin of enslavement, is what makes it escalate so quickly. And then, and then the question was about, so what about the efforts we've made? Can you comment on that a little bit? Um, it's a follow-up, uh, in a sense, to the question that we just received. And the issue of, of uh, you know, trying to biblical reconciliation through human means. And has the church fallen into some of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well... I, I talk about that in my in my book, uh, Welcome and Justice. See, uh, justice has just got into the mainstream of the American life. I, you, you know, uh, eco justice on the on the on the law, and and um, and the issue is the. Is it difficult for people who have benefited so greatly from a condition for them to see the depths of it? I think we're breaking through a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're breaking through because there's a there's a there's another breakthrough we got to get is uh, is I meet so many people. Making that confession makes them feel so guilty that they become paralyzed. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important then that we build relationships that are genuine, mm -hmm. genuine. And, uh, and uh, it's even when we develop in these relationships, you don't start with money. Because when I go, I might have said this already. And this is a big one in my community. I, I'm an organizer. That's what I do. I, I can sort of get people to believe in something. Okay. And I get a, people together, and we we'll talk about what this problem going to be. These will be all black. All could be black and white. We start talking about it. We're about to get our hands around it. And somebody in the group will say, I know where you can get a grant. That's the end of this program. Because they're going to take their energy away from what they can do and think about what money going to do. And then when money come, you got to, you might not own it no more. You don't own it until you own it. And so the question is when we do organizing is delay the grant. Ask the question, what can we do without money? What can we do with the money we have? What can we do with the, with the, what we got in our own hand? Amen. And you start then to, to, uh, you own it. And when people who got something to go, because American mindset, success mindset is an investment. Good mindset, I want you to know that. They, they want to invest. They want a measurement. They want a measurement uh, uh, to it. So uh, give me the question again so I, 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 well, I, get, so caught, no, the, the, I get so caught up in my own No, that's all right. Uh, people are on the edges of their seats. You could just keep right on going. But the the issue it was of, of Ferguson and this the sin of 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 we're we're trying to work biblical reconciliation through human means. What I hear you saying here, the human means is grants, it's money, and so that then becomes the driving impetus. That becomes the driving it's point. not it's not the life together of where God has us. It's, right, it it right. seems to and, me. And, and and right, and 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 there is. Where I'm sitting and what I'm hearing, there are huge pools of money out there now of this of of of, of uh, this gate buffing relationship with these people, uh, you know these 
billionaires in these cities, Tom Cousin, and every place you go, you got these billionaires now. And they are forming a, a foundation to do that. They got more than they have people with a good idea, and we have more than um, they can't ex absorb the money in a creative way. Yeah. And if you start getting those grant, you know, that the planning of them and the way they do them will uh, up the salaries of the workers at such a state that when the five-year grant is over, the three-year grant is over, all those folk gonna leave right, yeah. and go get another grant for another program that pay them. And that's why we didn't have to work on the indigenous people mm -hmm. within the community. Yeah. And, and then it is not a quick fix for the kind of human development that we're talking about. Yeah. Human development, uh, you know, is, is in four, eight, 12 year slots. And so that it takes time to create uh, ownership. Yeah. And, and, and so the big grants without that uh, creates a false idea. Now, if as you grow, you're then able to make that application. You got the application there. And, and people are turning from, uh, not turning from, but people now are seeing development is, is, is again as being equally important as charitable, or consumable item. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, grants used to be the way that you stimulated the community, and, and government grants might still could do that. But for the, for the human development uh, grant, you got to get that in the people in a way that they lift a people within a community. And, and what you're doing is, is that you're breaking that pathological uh, condition that now the solution become an adequate solution that can be replicated in other communities. Yeah. Now you got something going. Yeah. You got something going. The multiplication. So it's, 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 not, it's, it's not an easy fix. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, uh, it's why we fixing, cry. Pardon me? It's why we cry Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. But in the process, we seek to be faithful as well. Yeah, yeah but it's not an easy fix. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Another question, please. And that's, again, that's why I, 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 I agonize because we're at a, for, and from my perspective and after 50 years, in my community now, my kids can get a job now, two of them, two, two in a family, and get a job they can make from eighty to hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're laying that on top of prosperity Christianity, mm -hmm. and not laying it on top of our own work ethic. Mm -hmm. And we're telling them they're gonna get it in some kind of mysterious way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's anti-Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's strong. Yeah. That's strong. The prosperity preachers are strong. In our, in our community. Yeah. And, and, I, and I cried when I, when I was going to Africa. And I, you know, um, I would cry when I would see this exploitation going there also. Mm -hmm. uh, the preachers coming in there and giving people. It, what was doing was the preachers was getting rich yeah. instead of raising the level yeah. of the people within the neighborhood. This is complicated. And we got to have that kind of discussion even as we get people concerned. Mm -hmm. And the big thing now is benevolent, again, we're talking about benevolent. Benevolence have changed. In old benevolence, uh, there was an aristocratic way. They put it in a foundation of family trust, and they would go hire somebody to do that for them. And they would, those people then would send the money to the people who make the most sophisticated grant. And so you get grant writers. So, so that, that, that's for This new, which is better, they want to bring that talent along with it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is an opportunity for real, authentic 
community development. So we, at one cent, we are caught like Isaiah was before the fall of uh, uh, the kingdom to Babylon. We're at an opportune time. The mother is about to give birth, but she's going to die in childbirth because they don't have the strength to deliver. And that's what we got now. We're almost like that. Uh, I was doing some stuff with the Gates Foundation. They wanted to give $10 billion a year to the National Negro College Fund. They wanted to no, no, $10,000 uh, every, $10 million, excuse me, 10, 10 billion, that's what it was. And, uh, and they couldn't absorb it to achieve their goal. It would have been a money trip, mm -hmm. but as they did the investigation. And so they had to stretch it out mm -hmm. over a longer period of time so they can get more results in, in, uh, in, in life. So it's a, it's, but I, I'm actually saying we had an opportune time. Yeah. We had an opportune time. And that's why that you young folks should go into these communities. And that's why I'm calling for multiracial because of the urgency of it. We can achieve it faster. And, and, and that's right. It's right. It's right. We won't have as much violence and all those things. It's right. It's the thing to do uh, to relocate live in those communities, nurture the people within the community. Um, yeah. And, and, the the and thing I like about that, Jeff, excites me. Yes. The thing I like about that is, is you're not saying just to do it, but it's, it's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, the dignity of the image of God in every person. Yeah, and, and that's, right. what, that's, and you, that's you, what you, you said You're making well. that. And, and, and what we are doing is not just doing like the world. We're often an alternative. Exactly. I mean, I think that's important. It's an upside down kingdom, so to say. I, I, um, I did it for, from 60 early on until 75. And that's when the Christian community development began. I saw we could do it better with the Christians. Okay, so we do Christian. It had more stability in it. It had more more character in it, and uh, in it. Yeah. And and uh, uh, but uh, I'm for all development. Yeah. You know, uh, right now, I, I a lot of businesses ask me. Some businesses ask me to come in now to help make their own corporation. Uh, we call it more jazz more relevant. In the South, they will say, our company was developing the old racist environment, mm -hmm. and we don't develop that culture. And everybody know a culture is hard to break. And so, would you come in and work with us, and how can we create a, a culture of more justice? Mm -hmm. with the, because they see the more mm -hmm. dynamics of, uh, of that. Theft is one of the most difficult things in, in energy. Uh, we got to do something about the telephone. Uh, uh, people are not giving their full attention to their job. Uh, I go into the stores, they cook it, they take care of their uh, dinner. They're telling their children, they're running it on the phone. Uh, and, and when you get a pattern of that, you weaken society. Mm -hmm. You weaken society. If somebody hire you for eight hours, you need to do eight hours worth of work. I, nobody care about you calling your children. Ain't nobody care about that. But that you talking continually on the phone, and now they be working. And, talk, and, and sometimes I have to wait till they get on the phone for them to check me out. <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, that's sloppy. Yeah. That's sloppy yeah. Yeah. in our society. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that's what the yeah. Christian yeah. virtue, that's what I mean. The Christian virtue yeah. give you a sense of integrity, yeah. uh, whether you're working for a Christian, mm -hmm. a non-Christian yep. yep. organization. Great. Thank you. Jeffrey? Uh, thank you, Reverend Perkins, for your lecture today, and uh, more generally, for your transparent love of God and neighbor. Uh, today, it's very easy for many of us to bash the church rather freely, and um, I'm struck, on the other hand, by your story. If anyone knows your story, you've probably been more mistreated by the church than most of us 
can ever imagine. And, um, and yet when we listen to you talk about the church, you don't hear that. You're, you're, the way you talk about the church is positive, it's hopeful, uh, it's um, only um, with, good, with good words. And so I guess my question is twofold. What would you say to us who can speak so critically of the church so freely? And on the other hand, um, what is it in your own vision of the church that allows you uh, to hold it up as something worthy to um, believe in, to hope in, and um, to shy from criticism? Would, would somebody say what he said again? <laughs> so you, you're, um, many of us can criticize the church so easily. Uh, when we Men listen, of you do what? It's so easy to criticize the church. When I listen to you, you've had a story uh, where... Uh, the church has treated you poorly. You've seen the church at its worst. And yet when we listen to you, your vision of the church, the way you talk about the church, is full of love, of hope, of compassion. Uh, you hold it up and emula uh, something to be emulated. And so my question is, what would you say to those of us who freely bash the church? Why should we perhaps think twice about that? And then on the other side, what is it about you uh, that sees the church so differently? Yeah, perhaps I you. you could share I with us. I, I think it's the love is the final fight. I've grown there. You get the idea. I've grown there. I've grown in in my in my. Um, you don't hate them, and you you don't hate them first. There is not much room in Jesus's outreach for hate. He said, "Love your enemy. Pray for them." So I think I'm growing there. You know, I think I'm growing there. I'm also, uh, I'm growing in, in age. I've been around, and, uh, and some of those churches are in very difficult places because of their wealth and class. And those people is responding to me. So I'm wanting to give them opportunities. Uh, Vincent, uh, we got now uh, churches in the South who is both integrated or growing in that way, but wants to start with planting multiracial churches because they know it's a limit to their own growth. Because churches take on pattern, you know. Like I could go to uh, Grand Rapids, for instance. I, I there's there's one church downtown I go to where all the rich people go. Not all the rich people. Well, my goal with them is for them to plant churches that are multicultural churches. Now, what happens when they do that? That church begin to change. And in Memphis. I mean, Fourth Presbyterian Church there, Christ United Methodist Church there. Those are, are older, wealthy enclaves of people there, and they are some of the great supporters now of this multi-racial church. So I'm seeing, I'm going past, and so some, what you're asking me, should we hothead over Criticize the church. I say, I'm saying you shouldn't over criticize. We should we should give them a chance to be involved. Uh, we should give them a chance to be involved. And I think we're going to find more benevolent there than we than we think. Um, and, I, and, I, and so I think I'm growing there. I think I'm growing there in uh, in that. And 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 I'm getting a feeling again. Uh, you know, my message is. If you listen through, it's pretty tough. But we are trying to preach the truth in love. Trying to preach the truth in love. And, uh, yeah. I think that's what you hear. That's what, and, and now, my strength and weakness, I didn't make a covenant if I ever amount to anything, I was going to do something for people. So I want to win. I'm heavy competitive. You, 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 I'm heavy competitive. I'm just you know, I want to. 
I want to win, and I don't have long to go. When you're 84, you don't have long to go, and I really want to win. I want to help. I want to help the poor. Uh, my last thought with playing. Uh, I, I started giving an illustration. I, I'm, you know, I'm getting old, a little see now, and you forget certain things. You get on a roll and you forget it. My daughter said to me, uh, this motivates me. We was teaching, I, was, I told you about I started somewhere talking about, I, I was deciding my daughter and I didn't finish it. And, uh, and, and we was at the cross where Jesus was dying, fixing to die, and he told John to take care of his mother. He told uh, his mother, this is now your son. And the Bible says he, John took her into the house from that time on. And when I did that, it hit me that morning. My daughter said to me, your name is John. It was somehow, it, and it hit me that when my mother was sick, dying, they said I was, she was skin and bone, and I was skin and bone, and um. Uh, and a lady in the community, after she died, uh, some lady in the community saw me as a baby. It's in my book that I just wrote down. And, uh, and she gave milk for, for me because I was thinking, I'm drinking, I'm drawing the milk out that killed her. And so I was guilty. I felt guilty in that moment that I, I killed my mama. And then my daughter stood up and said, you didn't kill your mama. He said, it happened exactly the way she would have wanted it to happen. Boy, that put pressure on me. It has been on me ever since. Good pressure. She going to say to me when she meet me in heaven, everybody want this. Everybody want this. They want their mother to say you well done. I do. I do. I want my mother to say that. But I think that's what she's going to say. I think she's going to be happy. But she's going to ask me, what did I do for other people like her? Amen. That would be gratitude. Amen. I Thank like you. Wait a minute. I like it. I like it. I, I want to see her. We need some gratitude. I'm glad I'm a pretty successful guy. What am I going to do with it? And I think that's where the joy is at. I'm crying out of joy. Yeah. I started the WIC program. I helped start the WIC program for pregnant women like my mother. You know, that's a world national program. Still working, still working, still working, Amen. still working. Uh, you can Google my testimony back in 1968 before the Senate nu Nutrition, McGovern Nutrition Committee. That committee was, in other words, that was so powerful, it, he got, uh, uh, became a candidate for president because he was head of that committee. It was just when we were discovering poverty in the, in the so, you know what I mean? So I, 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 what I'm calling for, young people, I mean, this is our weakness is um, Christianity is too part-time. It needs to become a way we live. Amen. And that we should be organizing. Uh, uh, um, and, and businessmen that want this, they want to get the joy out of being a good businessman and how they can use their resources in a way uh, to be responsible. 
And, and that's as I go into this new age, that cloud, that little hand of this new reality. Uh, that's my challenge. I, I don't think it's a contradiction. I don't think it'll make you poor. I don't think it'll make you poor to feel a deep sense of responsibility mm -hmm. for the prosperity. I mean, I like my big house. I, I like all of that. You get that day, I enjoy it. But I want to try to be responsible. Yeah. Thank you. Let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Perkins. <laughs>